this video, I'm going to concentrate on getting you started with a starter. I'm totally not that funny. You may have clicked on this video for a few different reasons. Perhaps you're looking for a way to reduce or eliminate ultra processed food. Maybe it's for the health benefits of homemade sourdough. Maybe you just want to make bread from scratch because you enjoy the extra work. Or maybe you're just curious. Either way, making your own sourdough starter or activating a frozen starter is probably one of the easiest things you can do, but it does take patience and about 10 minutes a day for one to two weeks. It could take a little bit longer depending on your environment, but I will get to that later. And if you do find this information useful and you're enjoying my videos, please hit that like and subscribe button and the notification bell because it really does help me to keep going and I really do appreciate it. So what am I talking about when I use the word starter? What a starter is is a small batch of culture that you can keep growing on its own. And then when you're ready to make bread, you can take a portion of it and you still keep your starter set aside so you can keep growing it and use it for future bread making. Sourdough starter is made from two ingredients, flour and water. But what makes this flour and water mixture sourdough is the beneficial bacteria and the wild yeast that develop in it. One of the coolest things is that lactic acid bacteria and the yeasts that end up making your particular starter depend on everything from the type of flour you use to your location. Yep, where you live, your environment, and the surrounding air, all of that is going to make your starter unique to you. So even when you buy a sourdough culture, the result will be different for you than someone in the next town over who's starting with the same culture. Now there's a few things I do wanna cover before we get into the process, and these things will help set you up for success. First, temperature and humidity are very important in this process. That's all going to impact the time it takes to create your starter. And the types of flour you use will also affect your starter. You've got all-purpose flour, you've got bread flour, whole wheat flour, whole grain flours. They all work, but you'll get different results and your starter bacteria and yeast will respond differently to each type of flour. When I started this process, I was using this guy right here, a double zero or double op flour, and my starter was kind of wimpy. And I mean, it was barely making any bubbles. It was not really rising. I decided to switch to a whole grain einkorn flour, which is the type of bread I wanted to make anyway. Once I did that, it, it really took off. I probably could have continued with the original flour I was using. It would have just taken more time. There's a little bit of trial and error and your bacteria and yeast may respond differently. You don't have to buy any fancy flour unless you want to. There's definitely some tried and true combinations. Don't be afraid to experiment. You may come up with something you didn't expect, but is just as exciting as if you would have followed a standard recipe. You will, however, want a food scale of some sort. This is because volume measurements can make a significant difference in results versus if you weigh the ingredients. And what I mean is measuring with like a measuring cup versus weighing the ingredients. This is again due to the environment and the differences in temperature, humidity, and the density of the flour. So for example, if there's a lot of water vapor in the air, so it's high humidity where you're making your starter or your bread, your flour is actually going to absorb some of that water. If your flour has expanded at all, that measuring cup is gonna hold less of the flour than if it weren't humid. And that means you're gonna end up with less flour than you need for your recipe. There are times where you may want to use volume. I'm going to do a, a video later on on making a sourdough ciabatta, which is super great. And that is where I will do one measurement with volume instead of weight. And I'll explain that in that video. There's two ways you can make a starter. You can buy a frozen starter that has a particular flavor profile, you know, like San Francisco sourdough or a rye sourdough, etc. But you don't have to. You can start your own starter from scratch with just your flour and water. 
The beauty is the process is exactly the same for a frozen starter versus making it from scratch after the first day. So once you've chosen what flour you want to use, here's what you got to do. On day one, you want to get a jar. You could use a WEC jar or whatever you have. Remember that eventually the starter is going to rise and fall and it can at least double in size. So make sure whatever you use, the size is big enough to accommodate twice, maybe a little more of what you start with. Now, if you're doing this without a purchased frozen starter, all you're gonna do is mix 45 grams of warm water and you're going to add 45 grams of whole wheat flour or 60 grams of all purpose flour. And all I'm gonna do is add the water to the flour and mix it until it becomes the consistency of pancake batter. If you can see it, it's, it's kind of thick like this. Now, this is if you don't have a frozen starter. If you do have a frozen starter, the only difference is this. You're gonna add the recommended amount of frozen starter, which would probably be about three grams. You're gonna add 40 grams of warm water and mix that together. After about 30 seconds, you can add 30 grams of flour, doesn't matter what the flour is, and mix it until it looks like pancake batter. Once you do that, cover your jar with a lid and you can use, I'm just using the mason jar lid, you could use a fermentation lid, you could use a coffee filter, muslin, t-shirt scraps, anything that you can hold on with a rubber band. The idea is you don't wanna let anything else contaminate it. Then you're gonna place this jar in a warm area for 24 hours for a little bit of heat if it's kind of chilly in your house, you can put it in your oven. Just turn the light on. If it's warm enough in your house, you can also just put it on the counter for 24 hours and that's typically what I do. Now, from here on out, the process is the exact same whether you are making your starter from scratch or if you're using a frozen starter. So on day two, you're not really doing anything, but at the 24 hour mark, you're gonna go ahead, open this up and give it a stir. That's it. Then you're gonna put the lid back on let it sit for another 24 hours. On day three, you're going to take this jar of starter that's been sitting for two days and you're going to add another 30 grams of water and stir that in. And then you're gonna add 30 grams of flour and mix that again. At this point, you may need to add a little more water or flour in order to get that consistency, but that's okay. You just don't want it to be too watery or too thick. And put the lid back on, put it back in your warm spot. Now on day four, you wanna grab a new clean jar and add 30 grams of the starter into it. You're gonna add 30 grams of warm water and stir, and then add 30 grams of the flour of your choice. Mix it, and you're gonna repeat this process here on day four for days five, six, and seven. At this point, your starter should be getting bubbly and rising to double its size and then falling back down again. If it isn't doing that yet, just keep at it. Remember earlier I stated that your particular environment and the type of flour you use can affect how long it takes to strengthen your starter. It can take more than two weeks to get it going. But once it's active and strong, you can go ahead and start baking with it. These really are the most important things to remember when you're making sourdough starter. You need to continue to feed your starter. You've just created a living, breathing thing, and it needs to eat to survive. These bacteria and yeast consume the sugars, carbs, and some of the proteins in the flour, and that's what causes the rise and fall. So in my process, I am feeding one to one to one. What that means is every day you'll take out 30 grams of starter into a clean jar, add 30 grams of water and 30 grams of flour. That is a one part to one part to one part ratio. And that is the minimum you should be feeding your starter. And this brings me to the second important thing to remember. Don't use all your starter to make your bread. Make sure that you put aside at least 30 grams of that starter so you can keep growing it for the next batch of bread you wanna make. At this point, you might be asking, well, I have to feed my starter every day? Not necessarily. If you plan on making bread every day, then yeah, you're gonna need to feed it every day. But really, if you're making bread every day, it isn't going to be that much of a chore to feed it every day. But what if you don't plan on making bread every day or you know, even once a week 
or once a month. What do I, is I still have to feed this every day? You're gonna go through a ton of flour. You do not have to feed it every day. I'll show you how to do short-term and long-term storage in my next video. I'll also be sharing my favorite sourdough ciabatta recipe, so keep an eye out for those videos. Well, I hope that you learned a lot about making sourdough starter and it wasn't very scary. Um, it does seem, I know sometimes when you've not done it before, it can seem very daunting, but flour, water, sitting somewhere, it's pretty easy. Just don't forget about it. You wanna keep it alive. And thank you guys so much for hanging out with me here on Tater Town. And don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe so you can see more videos that will help you do those things you never thought you could.